Hi listeners, thank you and welcome. Uh, it's another episode of On Mute with Verse One and Wei. And today we'll be speaking with a guest that has a genre defying sound. Some have described the sound as folksy, others as soulful, but no one has said the sound is not interesting. So we are going to be uh, speaking with him learning about his processes, his inspiration, and many more. So join us as we welcome Peter O'Hare. How are you, Peter? Hello, I'm good. <laughs> so as, as I said, you have a very uh, unique style. You, we can, it's hard for anyone to place you. Right. Even with your name, it's hard to place your name. I see True. your name, hear your name, and think you're uh, Irish, only yeah. to be uh, educated. <laughs> <laughs> that you're Scottish. So maybe we should start from that. Yeah. Has that really contributed to your unique style, your amorphous sound? Well, I suppose it, I, I'm from Scotland, from uh, just outside Glasgow, industrial town. I think industrial towns do tend to... Uh, bring out a lot of that as you said soul music rock music music with a story maybe authenticity so I think uh, cities do that also sense of humour is this the same big cities Glasgow Liverpool New York Chicago there's a rhythm to those cities that come out in culture and comedy and music so yeah it, it, it does have an influence yeah I like the fact that you mentioned those cities, New yeah. York, London, Liverpool. These are, by nature, chaotic places. Yeah, yeah. And one of the words, or one of the phrases you've used to describe your sound is um, mayhem. Yeah. <laughs> Melancholic mayhem. Yeah. How did you come about with this? Melancholy, again, it, it may be something from a working class, industrial background. There is maybe something of a, a work ethic. Like, Melancholy. It could be to do with the weather in Scotland, <laughs> which is great for songwriting because if I grew up in Malibu, I'd be writing songs about the sea and the surf, maybe. But uh, if you work in a maybe a, a city where, like in Scotland or, or Manchester or Liverpool, the weather forces you inside a lot of the time. So you're not out playing lawn tennis every day. And sometimes I, I think it's a, those hours spent on your craft in the bedroom. First of all, learning your instrument, but also allowing your imagination to roam. So although you're in maybe a bedroom in an industrial city, you can imagine being elsewhere. But I think it's those hours spent on, on your craft, I think it does come out in, 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 in the music. There's some there's a magic about about those places. I'm sure everyone says about about their home city, their, their hometown, but there is a sometimes that melancholy and it doesn't have to be a bad thing mm. it, it's different from a depression and illness which is a serious illness and these are serious but there's a, there's a melancholy that comes through uh, the great Irish poets and, and, and writers uh, and, and the, the folk tradition a, a melancholy that is almost celebrated and sometimes you, you find happiness in that melancholic minor key music that can be actually quite Uplifting, yeah. It's interesting. It's interesting. You, um, you've just gone right into the music, playing in minors. Yeah. Because I've always, I've always thought of music as metaphor, metaphor yeah. for life. And yeah, yeah. That's why you, we can describe a sound as a mournful music or exciting music when yeah. um, it's, it's composed. If we were to describe the, uh -huh. the Celtic experience yeah. uh -huh. that births as brooding yeah. sound, would you say it lends itself well to writing in minor? Would you describe it as a minor, uh, the, the minor scales? as opposed to maybe more parade music yeah. or uh, band music that Triumph works yeah. Or triumphant yeah yeah i think i, I, I think you can you, you can also write in, in, in some of the trick of songwriting is writing some that melancholy but maybe some of those artistic ideas in in, in a major key and sometimes i've i've, I've written songs like, like that as well it's maybe not as uh, as obvious but uh, as i said there's something about maybe some of the I think is the, the authenticity, and even if you're writing overtly pop music, which is 
I would also describe my music as pop music. If you go to count the Beatles and the Rolling Stones and people as pop music, I'd, I'd be glad to be <laughs> <laughs> called. So it's, it's, it's pop music, but that sort of, a, 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 there's an authenticity, I, I think, that uh, w- w- with myself that's got to come through. Even something in a major key and very poppy, uh, I've got to feel a, a, a connection that is written from uh, an authentic place, even if the song sounds like a throwaway song or a throwaway phrase, but for, for me there has always got to be a connection in there, a thread. That's an interesting one. <laughs> and I was going to ask, you know, there's uh, Peter the man, yeah, and then there's Peter the musician. Of course, we can't have Peter the musician without first Peter the man. Uh-huh. I think let's start w- with who Peter the man is. Built up by, uh, I think, experiences from Scotland and travelling to to China and everything as a writer, it's always given you lots of fuel for for, for, for writing. So I, I, as a man, any triumph and disaster <laughs> that, that I have met, they always have have, have, have the basis. And uh, I think Peter the Man is the the conduit for then releasing. And sometimes I say to the, you know in my small acoustic gigs, I get to to give you all my angst. In this therapy session, <laughs> and I leave quite happy because uh, uh, even though, and it's, it's hard. I'm, uh, I'm always going back to the, the songwriting, but as, as, as Peter the band, I would always take these experiences, and they would find their way into the songs. And even when you think you're writing about other people in the third person, and I've done, I've written songs about other people, inevitably, you're always writing about yourself, the, the man. So I said, if you want to know. Peter the man, you'll find him in the in the lyrics. Yeah. You know, in the lyrics and the music, because yeah. you know, some people say, "Oh, my music is uh, distinct. I speak for yeah. others." So what yeah. you see in my music is not necessarily yeah. a representation uh-huh. of my feelings uh-huh. and my yeah. thoughts. But for you to meet Peter the man, we only need to listen to his music. Is that correct? And it's, it's it's part of that that, that authenticity that, that comes through. That even if I'm describing someone else or I'm walking in someone else's shoes, it's always going to be from my standpoint. <laughs> uh, there's always going to be a, a part of that, uh, consciously or, or, or subconsciously. And again, sometimes I've sang and I've I've looked at lyrics of mine, and maybe after writing, you realise that part there wasn't really written for someone else. <laughs> it was actually it's the it's almost a lesson to myself or uh, I'm telling myself or I'm giving myself permission to do something there or I'm, but, but, whereas I'm, I'm writing in, uh, uh, about someone else. But yeah, I think uh, for me that that's part of that thread that keeps it authentic is that there's going to be part of me in the song, even if it's written about uh, another person. So one of the songs I write about is written about the story of John Paul Getty the third, the millionaire's grandson, and I wrote it years ago and, and it was from the perspective of someone who has everything but has nothing. So it was written about him after seeing that, a documentary, but there's still, when I sing it, there's still elements of yourself that, that come through that and almost a message to, my, to myself. So I'm not a millionaire's grandson, <laughs> but there's a, there's a common thread about listening to reason. The song's called it, you know, if I had listened to reason, yeah. So that message came from another place, but it resonates with me, and it wasn't supposed to. Yeah, yeah and um, speaking of which, one of the lines, I think, from um, the song Cry Your, Cry Cry your Name, name yeah. is that uh, I tried to be honest, or I tried to be yeah. an honest man. So if I'm seeing or listening to yeah, that, yeah. I can uh, assume that yeah, uh, yeah. Peter the Man is an honest man. <laughs> yeah, and, and, and it's something that that, that song is... Something again. The line after it says, "I I try too much, a little too much." Sometimes you can try too much to be honest, try too much to be kind, and sometimes in relationships, there's a point where you realise it's it's not just you yourself; it is the other person in in the relationship. So you can try uh, to be all, all these things, but sometimes it, it isn't enough because the other person has to accept some responsibility, and sometimes. That can be in, in relationships. That that can be, you know, uh, you like to think, oh, if I had done this better, I'd done this. But uh, but no, sometimes it is a, a realization. So yeah, try to be honest. Another line is that sometimes you know, the realizations is that 
bad things happen to the good. Uh, and that's a very simple way of saying, you know, you can live your life and try and be good. But sometimes bad things do happen to good people. And, and how you recover and react to that is part of the, the strength within someone. So uh, these are little lines. As I said, sometimes I write them for other people. And that song cry your name isn't necessarily about one person. But that's when some of the messages come back and I read it later and you're like, yeah, maybe <laughs> it was more close to home than I, I wanted to admit. Yeah, yeah, that's um, uh, so in a way, in a way, it seems to me that when you write or some of your music, it's um, cathartic for you. It's um, almost like personal and autotherapy, if one, if one should yeah, would and, say. And, and, and I try not to be the over, but uh, it's the same when I'm playing even, even a solo concert. I find that if there's three people in the room, or there's 30 people, or if you're lucky, 300, uh, I can't give a different performance because there's only 10 people in the room. And a few weeks ago, I played at a small concert, and I, I play it the same way as I would, with the same emotion than I would to 300 people. Because the emotion's in, in the song, it's not necessarily me trying to add an emotion or trying to be an actor. Uh, I'd love to be a better actor, but, but, but I'm not. So when I sing the songs, uh, what I've written, the message in the song is is the emotion that, that, that I deliver. Uh, and I deliver it not the same every time, but maybe with the same emotion every time. I can't add or take some of it away. It's, it's what the song is, what I deliver, so yeah, uh, could be maybe a curse. <laughs> you know, there are those who criticise contemporary uh, popular music as mm -hmm. being somewhat dishonest. So I'm trying yeah. to, uh, while we're still on the subject of honesty, yeah, yeah. would you agree to this? Because the criticism is that the songs are just being made the songs that have been made are songs that they know people would react to yeah and, uh, sometimes they push um, particular uh, ideas and all that because they know that this is what many people want to hear yeah, Not, yeah. Um, there's a lack of genuineness and in a way by extension some dishonesty in the music right yeah what, what would you say what would you say to those who come up with that I think if, if, if you listen to tracks now and tracks it's probably the, a similar argument they gave when maybe the Beatles came out <laughs> in the 1960s you know she loves you yeah yeah, yeah. I think uh, songs about relationships will always be popular and and, and it might be that they, they, they try and, as you said, trying to be a bit more prescriptive about how they deliver the, the lyrics. But I think a song that connects with with an audience, they have to feel that it's, it is about them. And I think the easiest way to do that is to talk about relationships because we all have relationships in different forms of, with each other. So any song that, that connects with relationships, you know, the core themes of love, love and loss, uh, you know, good and bad, uh, good and evil relationships. Yeah, I think the, these common themes, I think that they, they, they try to distill it nowadays, but I don't think they can get away with what really connects. So I think a good song today, a good pop song, you know, is still about maybe your first love. And they're still writing about it in 2023, and they probably will still be writing it because these things, you know, maybe to... The people that are, that are buying them or something that they can connect with. The language may be slightly different, but I think the themes will stay. You know, I, 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 I tend to agree with you because I think ultimately the, these songs are about the human experience. Yeah, and yeah, and yeah. in the last um, 10, 15,000 years, we haven't really changed much. Yeah. I, I mean, I can imagine the uh, the pain that our ancestors felt yeah. moving across the, the sile or the yeah. sands of uh -huh. uh, Africa. It's still what we would feel today when you're yeah. jilted by, by love or when you experience loss. Yeah. I mean, if that loss is not getting a job, whether it's yeah. not getting a job or yeah. mm -hmm. uh, finding out that your traps have been That's broken right. by, yeah. uh, by, yeah. by the animals being hunted. So I think you, um, in, a, in a way that is true the themes would remain the same. Yeah, so, yeah. But what has always been um, fascinating about music or art or poetry is that we uh, are drawn into the unique experience mm. 
of these broad themes. So when mm. Yeats is yeah. writing about the futility of war yeah. and as um, Irish airman forces his death, and there are several um, poems or uh, tomes written about the futility of that of that yeah. experience. Uh, we can. Yeah. It's vivid what yeah. um, each of these. Yeah, don't check the Coramest, Wilfred Dom, and 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 Sigrid Sassoon, and and the great war poets. Uh, it's just in in, in Yeats and in writing, and uh, and it's amazing how still resonant that that is today, and 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 will be about loss, and uh, it's almost so. The criticism, each generation needs yeah, it. Yeah. The criticism, <laughs> yeah, I think is that we are missing those nuances mm-hmm. because now like you said the music is becoming more prescriptive yeah. more industrial shall we say yeah. mm-hmm. and um, is that a bad thing I think that there's still an, an author that even if you looked at I think I, I, that was also level when we went from the guitars and maybe the punk went into the, the age of in the 80s and synthesizers which were uh, industrial pop your beloved string instruments disappeared <laughs> and, and no band would be seen with a guitar and it had to be on, on stage with two keyboards and, and people said, you know, it was drum machine without feeling and it was the... And the 808. But, and it, the 808 and the sampler. But that there's some of the most beautiful love songs came out of that 80s and Annie Lennox and Eurythmics and uh, Alison Moye with Yazoo and a sofa. But it was also, it, it was the human element over that backdrop, that humanity that gave that feel. So the instrumentation lost it, but uh, there was there was still a, a humanity. And even when it was like Laurie Anderson and Oh Superman and a sampled vocal, there's the, the, there's still room for a human touch in that in that connection. And uh, I, I hope we never lose that. I hope so. That thread. Uh, but you're right. The, the instrumentation it doesn't have to be lush strings. To I love it. Can be something. Uh, you know, like Johnny Cash's version of of Heart. You know, which is oh, which is just one guitar. And that, uh, but the, but some of my favourite singers are, are those that can that can deliver that. Not a technical, but a the a humanity in their performance and, and voice, and it's still something that uh, that is maybe genetically wired in in us that, that we do connect with that. So uh, even in 2023, there'll be certain performances that, that we watch, and even if it's in a a reality. TV pop idol program or something. There will be uh, some performances that, that do capture the zeitgeist and the whole nation, and it's usually these ones that can that can connect with people. So uh, I think there's still hope. <laughs> <laughs> there's still hope in music. So I know you're a multi instrumentalist. So I think I'll start by asking. Yeah. How many instruments do you play? You can play a lot of instruments badly, or you can play a lot of instruments. <laughs> okay, well, let me rephrase so, that. How many do you play well? You play well. So, but uh, well, well enough. On, on this album, it happened that I ended up playing all the instruments, uh, and it started off as an acoustic. I knew I wanted acoustic guitar and a vocal to be the spine that run through all the tracks. So I recorded them live. That was the decision not to do a lot of edits. So I went in over two days and recorded all the vocals and. Acoustics and we had that, and then I decided I did use a click track because I knew I might want to add, and then I decided on some tracks I would put piano and added bass guitar, harmonica, keyboards, and finally I put drums on, which is not the way to record. <laughs> but uh, so some tracks end up with you know drums, bass, harmonica, and you played all this yourself. And I played all this, yeah. That's not bad. Again, uh, I was going to get other people in. To, to play on that but the, the way the recordings go the good thing about uh, playing the instrument yourself is that uh, you don't have to you, you make decisions like some of the songs only have the drums in the verse and no drums in a chorus and some drums the tracks only have drums in the chorus now, now for me to tell a drummer that would, would feel strange and if we rehearsed it as a band oh. the, the drummer would never stop at a chorus so uh, it led to some interesting sort of a uh, Results because of uh, because of the fact that I didn't have to deal with any other egos <laughs> apart from uh, apart from myself. So I I could edit edit myself and I didn't offend anyone. So so <laughs> there are those who uh, say or consider their voice to be an instrument. So I've asked, yeah. oh, do you play? Oh, no, I don't play an instrument, but I I don't 
play yeah. a traditional instrument, but my voice is an instrument. Yeah. Where do you stand on that? Do you think it's nonsense or is there some merit to that? Because, uh-huh. I'm asking this, because <laughs> of that song, uh, one of your songs, uh, uh, Cry Your Name, yeah, I think yeah. it was, there was a section where it was. It felt like you were playing your voice. You kept yeah. going, there was yeah, modulations yeah, yeah, and all yeah, that. Yeah. So it struck me, like, hmm, this is a multi-instrumentalist. Is he just, um, is he playing his voice here? What, do you consider your voice an instrument? Yeah, I, I, I never considered myself a, a, a singer, which is so... I played previously in, in, in bands where I would write songs for a singer. I never considered myself a, that I would be able to sing. And it was out of necessity that I became became the singer in, in some of these bands. So I still consider myself a songwriter. I'd say I, I, I'm, I'm a songwriter. And I'd be happy to write songs for other people. I think I'd really in, enjoy it. But I, I never considered myself to be a singer. So I thought, I'm a guitarist. In as far as it's a, I can play enough guitar to get my song across, uh, and then I would sing. And, and you're right, there's some of the the, the, the pieces there that it is like an, an instrument. But uh, I'm only now becoming comfortable calling like myself a, 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 a singer, singer because it it wasn't that I started singing in a band. I always I always wrote songs. When I got my first guitar, uh, I, I always composed songs. I I, I didn't learn anyone else's songs mm. I would so before I even knew what a chord shape was I would make up melodies myself and uh, I even had a kazoo <laughs> you can remember the kazoo and I would use the kazoo just to give me a melody because I didn't sing and I would use a, a kazoo to to, to to get a melody over, over, over my chord but I was always interested in, in songwriting rather than trying to to particularly emulate anyone but I would listen to any music I had mm. uh, because it was a chance for me to practice along with it. Uh, so yeah, and I never considered myself a, a a singer. So if someone now mentioned the voice, I always think of that as being secondary to what oh, is a vehicle to get my song across. But but I understand that that and and for a while I didn't even think about it. But but now I think more about. Being melodic in my voice and uh, yeah, and it, it, it was quite yeah, um, uh, striking listening to that because it went uh, on for about fifteen seconds, yeah. and I'm like, okay, you were still holding that breath, and you're sort of like you were yeah, playing uh, notes. Uh, just, it, yeah, uh, sorry, uh, that that was for someone who doesn't yeah, consider yeah. himself a singer. <laughs> that uh, that's pretty impressive. Now you said you started out as a songwriter and then made the transition into. Is that typical? Because I think what I generally here is people moving in the opposite direction. Yeah. Now, when I say I, I wrote the songs, um, no, no one heard the songs. <laughs> they, 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 they were written, so I feel like I've got this alternative lifeline where I've written 10 albums, I've had the difficult second album, I've had the electronic phase, I've had the acoustic phase, and I've, I've written, so I've always written a lot of songs. And even for this album, I, we maybe recorded about 13, and we brought it down, I brought it down to about 9. I've got a lot of uh, Lots of songs that that, that I, I like to to write, but it was always as a, a as a songwriter, and as I say, I wanted to play enough guitar that I could convey the song, uh, and same vocally that I had enough that I could convey a, a, a melody. But uh, to me, the song was always this complete. I didn't see it as you know, this is the singer's part. It's, it was uh, the and, and and like that. That's why I like sometimes the the, the less is more sort of a, a approach, and and on this. Album. I deliberately didn't try to overdo and play lead guitar over thing. I tried to keep it quite raw, and that was the, the 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 basis of just recording acoustic and vocal at the beginning. Just I wanted to have this common thread, and not to try and overwork it. And although it was recorded over a few years, the actual recording time was very short uh, in in the, the sessions. So there's a lot of mistakes on it. And I, I like that. <laughs> There's a lot of mistakes on it. I mean, it's part of the, the honest uh, yeah, and, and, and the edits. I didn't, I, di- I didn't edit a lot in it either. So I wanted it to feel alive, and I don't think I was for any audience. It was, it was for myself. I needed that <laughs> in order to to give to be an honest man. <laughs> so I'll ask, I'll ask you, because this is like the. The chicken and egg yeah. um, question or dilemma mm. as well. What comes first for you, the music 
or the lyrics in crafting this yeah. album and the songs of this album do you yeah. go through oh, you have um, a lyric yeah. that's um, on paper and you said you know what let me write music to this or you have the music and then write the uh, the lyrics to it well, well so far for this album it's, it's always been the music first so I always have have the music uh I've tried writing down sort of a sort of a lyrics first and so I've got what I would call poems <laughs> they, they end up rambling they end up going on for pages and I, I, maybe I'll release a, a, a book of poetry <laughs> later on because the, but but for the, this album it's always the, the, the music and the, and I'll, I'll sing a melody I'll sing a, a nonsense lyric over it but the, there might be something that inspires me it could be a, a, a phrase or a person that, that maybe acts as an inspiration and then it'll be nonsense but lyrics until I fill in the, the, the gap uh, and then I'll write the, the, the lyrics for that feel uh, to, to fit the, the melody but also the, the, the lyrics have got to be as honest as, as, as the music so again I, I, I don't want to write anything in lyrics that I, I feel is a throwaway you know I like the great songwriters like you know like I mean, I'm not calling myself like, like Paul Simon, but Paul Simon who will use one word or the way he enunciates one word is just, ah, you know, it's been thought over and, and there's space for it. Uh, and I, I like the idea of being able to sing simple lyrics. And one of my favourite lyrics of all time, and I love Dylan and I love Simon, but I love Prince, you know. To me, that's like, oh, that is genius what's conveyed in that sign of the times, in that lyric. And I always thought, no, you can be poetic, and I think there's room for for poetry. But that economy and getting that emotion and message in that that is, I think, that's a genius. <laughs> Your answer is that you first write the music, music yeah. and then uh, write the lyric. Do you have any song where this hasn't been the case, where the reverse has been the, tr um, the no, case? And, and and I have one on my iPhone notes. I have lots of titles that I think that's a great title for a song, and I've got them all there, and I. I've never used one yet, <laughs> and it's almost like a safety net. I think that, that that's a great, you know, that's a great title. So, so one of the notes I've called it's called Radium Girl. Radium Girl is I've written that down. The, the, that story is about. It's kind of tragic. The it used to be radium was the, the, the luminescence, know, on the yeah. and the radium girls used to put the radium on and the, to to make the the brush tip. They'd put it in their mouth and. And oh, the radium and died of cancer. Oh. And, uh, and there's some bit of that story about radium girl that the, the beauty and the, the, the mechanic the what that I thought was quite fascinating. Now, now that's a and that's a story that I, that I know there's a there's a song in there, but I haven't written yeah, <laughs> I haven't really. written it yet. But to me, the music the music always suggests something, and there's something in the music that suggests there's a meter in the music, and that meter then translates to like a poetic meter. Uh, and, and and lyrics uh, and like I'll, I'll maybe block it off and uh, I'll sing it I'll know it's got to last I certainly uh, but maybe some inspiration will come and maybe the song will change as as, as I'm writing it and the, uh, the, the the theme and sometimes the theme can come from just a few words like listen to reason and and that will be right listen to reason and that then becomes the hook for, for the chorus but what does listen to reason mean and then the verses will Stem, just grow stem out from that and grow out from that yeah right. interesting because this is a nice segue will be a nice point to segue mm -hmm. into another idea mm -hmm. that runs in my head would you describe music of course there's the the science of music mm -hmm. and then there's the the art of it mm -hmm. but would you say increasingly with technology mm -hmm. and um, the advances in the modern world music or the musician has become more of a craftsman than an artist or an artisan has become an artisan rather than an artist yeah uh, I, I think the technology d does exist where you can in block form you can if you're limited by any you know technical ability you can use the tools there are a lot of artists today that, 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 are, that are very creative uh, and I, I think there's you know I said that there are a lot of good artists. It may be harder to find because there's so much music n n nowadays. Uh, and I think people can be creative with the technology. Just like in video game programming, the mathematics, you can be creative in 
mathematics. You need imagination. To go to the moon, people had to imagine what it would be like to go to the moon. They'd never been there. So although they had the technology, you need to be creative and have imagination. For uh, So I think within the, the, the technology, people can use it in its form or people can be imaginative about how they use the technology. And I think the, the people that use their imagination are the ones that, that rise and the ones that, that, that we hear about. So, yeah, I think if it's used without imagination, it's very sterile. <laughs> yeah, but I think if, if you use the technology with uh, but, but with imagination, you'll get good results, yeah. And we're looking at how it's the process, the creative process and the publishing process, shall we say, mm-hmm. has been shortened yeah. immensely. I mean, what would take about four days or four yeah. weeks by necessity, <laughs> you yeah. know, not because the people were uh, slacking or not, but you, you had to go to the studio. They had to record on, on a cassette or mm-hmm. even um, on vinyl and they had to take it to be mastered. I mean, all of all these things can yeah. be done in one sitting. Mm. Has that reduced the attention to the, the quality of music that's been shown now? Because it's now... Uh, a situation of fail fast and um, we can we can learn as we go is that a good thing has that improved I think, music? I think the, the, there's always the the, 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 the skill of it, the, the process and sometimes that process is, is valuable uh, you know if within psychology the, the Google effect the, I don't know how to get the answer but I know where to get the answer yeah but, but that process of how to get the answer uh, and I think with Chat GPT, the now a lot of people are worried about what well, chat GPT, but the, there's still a room for creativity that, that still can be faster than that because at the time you go and look for an answer, if you ask someone to come up with a rap and a rhyme, there, there are people that can do it faster than. So the, 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 the skills that the, and those creative skills will, will survive. As people say, they're not worried about artificial intelligence. It was artificial stupidity they were worried about because <laughs> it's still, the, it was still the, 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 the human interface was what people are worried So I think it's easier to do that. Now. If we listen to what we consider classic records, a lot of them are out of time and they speed up and they slow down. But we weren't aware of that until you put a metronome against it. So the, the humans were very forgiving when we listened to that. Uh, and the danger is if you use that template and try to be too strict to that, t- sometimes people can just follow the same template and the same template, but it's more democratised now. People can, uh, as you said, they have the complete package, but if you're uploading then 60,000 tracks a day to Spotify, <laughs> it then becomes a marketing thing. But it's always been a, a music, the difference between the music industry and the music business, and a way back to the first boy band, with the Beatles, you know, <laughs> they were a manufactured boy bands that were taken from Hamburg and cleaned up and put in suits and ties and then sold to a market that kids and their parents w- would like. And, and that worked, but, but their art sh- shone through that as well. And I, I think it, it still, there's still, as I said, the, the chat, the, people talk about the quality control now within music. If everyone can make music, is it does it less? Now? I think the good music will still surface and people still... But it is a, it's easier to make now, but maybe it's harder to, to discover within that to, to find. But uh, So in, in a way, <laughs> it is the business of music that's been most affected, yeah, not, not the quality of Not the quality of, of, of and, and I think the, the creativity is a little, and, and people will find new ways of being creative. And people will go back in cycles and decide, oh, you know, just like when the 80s ended, then people rediscovered the guitar again. And we had the grunge and that, you know, they were just rediscovering what was already there. And and people will maybe go back and say, oh, let's try it without the drum machine. Let's try a real drummer. And let's, <laughs> or let's try it. Uh, and I think when people listen to music, they, they, they will always go in, in cycles. You'll get people that will look at it from a different direction and maybe add a different element in. Uh, but it's cyclical, yeah. yeah. Okay. Your album is out. Yes. I want to ask, why did you choose that title? The Companion Ladder was a... It came to me from a novel. I think it was a, a Graham Greene novel. And it, the, the line they were describing travelling on, on a boat and the Companion Ladder was connects the, the officers to the, the, the lower deck. The word Companion Ladder, 
those two words together to me struck as well. It, 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 one, it was describing the the mechanics of the ladder, but companion ladder, as as we said earlier, about a metaphor about you know how companions and friends influence you through life and how the ups and downs of the ladder and ups and downs. It seemed to be that there were lots of metaphors coming from that companion ladder, and it, it struck with me. And it something that does connect all the songs on the album are all companionship in some form. So uh, I just thought that the, the title just seemed to suit the album and the collection of songs. Yeah. You know, I could, I suspected that there was a story yeah. because there's something about you that's um, <laughs> striking is you love words. You can, yeah. you can tell that you're at heart. If you weren't making music, you would have been a literary person. Yeah. So I knew that... You, you don't choose words yeah. uh, randomly. There's yeah, always true. a story. Yeah, yeah. And so uh, once again, I seem to have judged correctly. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> now, there were 13 songs recorded yeah. and uh, 13 tracks, but the final album has only nine. Yeah. What happened to the unfortunate songs that it make it? Would we hear them again? So, so some of the hear the good, so some I, I still play live, but... Uh, for this recording, I, again, as with the title uh, that seemed to choose itself, I think the songs chose themselves within the 13 and even with, within the order. Some songs were maybe similar. or All the songs started with this spine, this backbone of acoustic and, and vocal. Uh, and I had the 13 recorded and some stayed that way. The final track on the album is just a vocal and uh, a guitar, Simple Life. It stayed that way. And some songs just seem to naturally fade away. They may resurface again on another album, or as I say, I'll, I'll play them live. But it was actually, it seemed a natural fit. And the, the, they seemed, the songs seemed to choose them themselves. And it felt comfortable when I was left with the nine. I felt that that was a comfortable amount for what I was saying. And each song seemed to say something slightly different. There were different rhythms, different timings in the songs. Uh, so I think the... Some songs were maybe similar in some of the time signatures and some of the some of the messages maybe. Uh, so some may disappear and may be only for my ears, and some may re- resurface. But I'm very happy with the collection that I've got. I think that is the companion ladder. Those nine songs. That are, uh, yeah. Oh, and um, I, I did enjoy listening to the companion ladder. Uh-huh. And one of my favorite songs is the Dead Man's Guitar. Yes. And not only did I like the title, because it just conjured up this image of uh, a violent gun duel in the wild, wild west, yeah. and there's, uh, there's one man lying dead, mm-hmm. and uh, the victor is just blowing the smoke off his gun, yeah. the smoking gun, and he's just picked his guitar and, you know, said, you know what, I'm going to write an ode to this yeah. uh, beautiful carnage. Yeah. So what led to that song what is the story behind that story title behind... and you know yeah. the, the way it also opened it was yeah. something cinematic about the first first um, the, the first few um, oh, yeah. uh, movements yeah, in, yeah. In the song. Uh-huh. so what was going on when you were writing and producing and creating it, that it, song it, it's a song that I've had well and you asked earlier about my, my process it's always been the music first and uh and the, the lyrics, but Dead Man's Guitar was a title that I did have. And it's actually completely different from the song that, that, that I wrote. And I, I, I'll explain why. The Dead Man's Guitar in my original song was, you know, uh, it was a sad story of years ago, a, a family friend who had a, had a guitar. And when I would visit the house, he had this lovely Martin guitar. And he used to play it. And I used to love playing this guitar. Now, unfortunately, he passed away. Uh, and we went to visit his his, his widow and the, the request she made was could you play the guitar because she wanted to hear it played one more time now that was the song and that is the song I will eventually write but it was just I think it was just too personal and if I had to write that song it would have been very personal And so I was never quite in the space to write that song because I think it was just too sad to write a sad song because it was a true song about a dead man's guitar. But in, in a beautiful way, you could be poetic about it. So I will write that song one day about the dead man's guitar. So I was actually playing a dead man's guitar that sounds 
kind of morbid, but it is the circle of life. Is it? So I had that title and I knew I wanted to, to write it. And when I sing the song, I don't sing it about this person, but the dead man's guitar, the fact that someone would play a dead man's guitar, that was one instance. The other instance would be, as as you, you mentioned, would be the dead man's guitar would be a, a more violent connotation to, to that. Uh, and it was cinematic. And, and, and what I have in my imagination when I wrote that song, it was in what you call the, the Wild West at, at the time, but it was a more sort of a family-oriented sort of a story about a brother who's down on his luck and he calls on his, his other brother to help him uh, take place a robbery. The robbery goes wrong because of that. The man's killed and he's sitting waiting for the, the law to come strumming a dead man's guitar. So it was a, a, a violent and the, and to me it's a it's a short film in there. <laughs> and I'd like to one day uh, you know uh, see that in cinematic form because in in my head it's the story of brother being drawn. They're not natural uh, thieves or any, but through circumstance have been drawn into that. He's been drawn into protecting his brother, and in the song he gives up his life to let the brother escape because. He has a family and a wife and children and in the last verse he we don't see him die but he stays to fight the law while he lets the brother escape so to me it, it's a there's a whole film in there <laughs> and one day hopefully i'll, I'll get to write so, it, so i wasn't too far <laughs> no, it, i wasn't too it was far well, and, 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 and it was cinematic as, as, as you mentioned there it is uh, i can see it as, as a cinematic song and again it's one of the instances as well i'm writing about someone else but this someone else is fictitious and it starts with a little sort of a guitar phrase yeah as well and, 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 and by the end of mixing because i was doing the album myself i was getting to i worked with with uh, brad uh, to do the mixing and at one stage i was like should we just cut that off brad because every time i hear that song it seems to have <laughs> and he did say no keep it in uh, because i'd heard it so often but it was just a way of, of introducing i suppose that was the Dead Man's Guitar played at the beginning. Oh. Again, I, I didn't know that when writing, but that's now what I hear is the introduction of the Dead Man's Guitar before we go into it. So you're correct, it was a, a, a cinematic uh, song, but the, the story is, you know, I suppose fraternal sacrifice in order to save... Uh, well, that, that's um, it's um, a noble, a noble, <laughs> yeah. noble theme, if, uh, to say the least. I feel... It will be remiss of me, mm -hmm. knowing your uh, background in uh, theory, mm -hmm. music theory, and even the uh, technical aspects mm -hmm. of yeah, music, yeah. not to ask you, mm -hmm. first, pertaining to this album, what it was like recording the uh, the album, which talking about the inspiration, yeah, yeah. writing, and you know the artistic part. Mm -hmm. Now let us talk about the... The technical part, yeah. the artisan, Peter the artisan. We've met Peter the man, yeah. <laughs> Peter the artist. Now let's know Peter the artisan. What was it like recording? The, because if you said you played almost all the instruments yourself, do you, do you set up your rig? Do you how do you mm -hmm. layer the instruments? You mentioned earlier you'd always have a an empty track. You know, yes. just take well, us yeah. into the recording session of uh -huh. City Lights. Yeah, this, yeah. Well, so the, the songs as they, they started off, and I went to the small studio Nugget Brevity of Sounds in the Hutong. So part of it, I could record it all at home, but part of me wanted a freedom to record the vocals and the acoustic guitar. Those would mean I wanted someone else to be able to just press record and play, and to free me from that, so that because I knew those two performances would be the the main performance, and most of the vocal takes are first or second takes from start to beginning on, on the track. So I wanted to do that, and I knew to do it that way, I had to be free of the technical aspects. So I booked the studio for two days in June, maybe two years ago, and, we went in and I said, I want to record. So it was very quick. Within the two days, the 13 songs were recorded. Wow. All the acoustic, all uh, the acoustic was recorded first. We did use a click track, uh, and then I sang the vocals over it in a complete take, and that's part of, the live feel that I wanted from it. And I knew from a producer's point, I didn't want to edit and 
to layer up the, I did backing vocals on one l- later on but I wanted that backbone and I think that was that search for authenticity as a as a, a, a producer I knew that if I could get that and if it sounded okay with just the acoustics and the vocal if there was that element of soul <laughs> would come through that I knew it. I could add other instruments and it would still be okay so we spent two days I'd done that I then took it away I recorded at home I recorded pianos uh, electric guitar over it, uh, organ, went back to the studios, did some backing vocals, layered up sometimes three or four part harmonies, uh, on, uh, and then took it away, listened to the tracks, some I said, that's enough. <laughs> but I wouldn't have drums on that. And again, because I was, I, there were no other musicians involved, I had the freedom to say, no, we can stop there. We don't need to go on. So that was very liberating. And then finally added bass guitar and then which is not the way you should do it, but I went back and added drums on final tracks. But hopefully when you listen to it, it sounds like it could be a live, a live band playing. But uh, So I know there's lots of mistakes on it, but to me, I think I managed to keep that authenticity through that with those complete takes. And it's not the way that modern recordings are, are, are usually made. And maybe that will sound a little bit different because of that. I did then work with uh, the mix engineer with Brad, to do the final mixing, mixing and, and and the, <clears throat> but the actual uh, said the elements were, were already there in, in recorders so the actual recording time is very short but it was over a, a long period of time so I got to live with the songs and the different versions that, that they were I got to decide how much to put on uh, what instruments to put on what not to put on <laughs> when to stop and it was quite a, a self-disciplined sort of a approach to the songs but that's why it's a very personal album to me and I felt in the end I couldn't I, did, I couldn't have anyone else playing on it because it was like maybe letting go so some people would call it being a control <laughs> a control freak but, but for, for me I, I felt if I don't do this I'll be somehow letting the album down so there may be a lot of therapy sessions that would maybe look through those statements and say there's time to let go but I, I, for, for me uh it was, it was a, in, in that process whether I do that again I might the next time get a whole band in and play it in completely different but uh, f- for this album I felt uh, it deserved that attention <laughs> well quite, quite um, uh, elaborate but something struck me while mm-hmm. we were speaking it was like you said you had editing in mind while mm-hmm. rendering your vocals mm-hmm. do you think that would have um affected or changed your uh, performance if you didn't have to edit it would you have performed differently or uh, but basically what I'm asking is the knowledge yeah. that you were going to edit it yourself did that force you to be more economical and more focused in um, recording I almost in, in my head uh, gave myself the, the perception that I was recording to analog tape where you couldn't go back or it's very difficult to, to edit so I wanted to complete I didn't want to have to go back and fix any bits of it so some people call it red light fever in the olden days when, when they press record but also when you press record and play there was a maybe an adrenaline or an attention that focused you I wanted that feeling and is that, that's why I deliberately chose to do those with someone to, actually pressing the play and record because I wanted the, them to say recording now and I wanted that feeling of right, this is the take. There's no, I'll fix it in the mix or I'll go back. I wanted it to be an authentic performance. Oh, if oh. that makes sense. Oh, yeah, yeah, it does, <laughs> yeah. it does, it does make sense. So the music, do you write the music as well before you record? So that I'm mm-hmm. asking this because you said you could have some of this performed with um, yeah. a band. So I imagine a situation where you hand you hand the notes mm-hmm. to the uh, bassist, and mm-hmm. this is what the bass would play. Or I mean, I guess this is my choir background coming out, where everyone yeah. has a music shit. So do you yeah. do you write that before See, you record? I don't actually use music theory. I, I don't actually. I mean, I have a little bit of knowledge of of, of music theory, but I don't actually. I'm not a music. I, I can't write out charts. And, for people, so it's all all the instruments I've learned and all the music I write has all been by, by, by ear. Huh? Uh, and seeing that, talking about te- technology, I have written for uh, string quartets before using technology, where I played the piano and the parts were turned into cello, and that was a great experience. It was for a soundtrack for a film, and 
actually conducted it live. Uh, and that was a great experience working with these great So great, now we're, great we're meeting Peter, the conductor. The conductor. <laughs> so I, I, think it, and I, I was using technology to its, its full extent then, but I, I, I don't... At the moment, I'm, I'm rehearsing w- w- with a live band, and we have the recordings to use now, uh, and the musicians are so good, they can listen to the chord, and I can say what the chords are and what the tempos. Uh, I, I know enough music to talk that, but I'm, I don't give out charts for that. For that, So for me, it was all playing by ear, and, and that's how I learned all my instruments. Uh, I've never had any musical lessons on, on, on any instruments, so um, I'm all self-taught and, and, and play by ear. There's a great advantage in being able to read a score because very quickly you can do it, and I admire people that, that, that do, but I've never felt that I have to really go back and study music. I feel it might change the way I, I prefer, you, you approach it. Uh, approach it. But, but I have used technology to produce scores of music that I've written, as I say, for orchestral pieces, uh, and it was it was great to be able to see how a cellist can take those notes and turn it in and wow, to hear music and played on real instruments was was great. So uh, there is a, a definitely a place for that. But for me, it's always been played by ear and self-taught. So that's um, <laughs> enlightening because I didn't know that you yeah. had um, you could play and then the computer or whatever yeah. would uh, write it out for the different parts. Mm. So uh, thanks for <laughs> for that noggin. Now I'm going to ask you about um, China. How mm-hmm. long have you been in China? Eight years now. China, eight years? Eight years. Eight years. Eight years. So that's, um, that's non-trivial. Yeah. So how much of China made its way into Companion Ladder, either yeah. through the inspiration uh-huh. or references or even musical influences? I imagine there are certain uh, Chinese sounds that would appeal to you. Did you infuse any... Oriental uh, melodies? Not consciously. The, I think the real impact that it had on my music in the true sense of the companion ladder was the, the community that actually... So the community that, that included uh, people from countries all over the world and, and people from, from Beijing. Uh, and those connections that I, I made with those people in those groups is where I, I built uh, playing uh, open mic nights. With, with Fred. And I found the music community in Beijing very inclusive. As I said, I've, I've worked with uh, Chinese musicians uh, and played with them. Our common language has, has been music, uh, and not necessarily one culture's music or, or sound, but uh, I don't think it would happen any other place than here in Beijing. The studio was recorded in, in a small hutong, and that experience of going, it's one of the most favourite walks, was walking down the hutong through the alley to get to the studio. Uh, and whether subconsciously, that made the experience, you know, uh, so much because it was a small studio in there. I think if I'd been walking to a big studio in Manhattan, it would have been a different sense. To me, walking through the hutong, I was soaking up that authenticity. And it might not have come out in overtly a Chinese sound, a Chinese melody, but certainly... The, I'd say that the hutong is in the companion ladder and when I think about the songs and the recording of the, the companion ladder it is the hutongs of Beijing which I will is the memory that, that, that I have and although some of the songs maybe even predate that or are about different cultures to me the companion ladder is the hutongs in the studio uh, for me so that's a very personal uh, I think that's a, a fitting way to round off our conversation today because if we don't round off I guess uh, we're just <laughs> going to be here till uh, the yeah. wee hours because we've got quite an interesting interesting story yeah interesting subject the album itself mm-hmm. I don't want to belabor the word interesting so I wouldn't use that <laughs> but the, the album itself is is um, fascinating it's okay. it draws you in I like the sounds I like um the first song is completely different to mm-hmm. the the next, mm-hmm. and the, there's a vocal range that sitting across from you, I wouldn't have believed came yeah. from you. <laughs> you see what I mean? Especially with a song, um, "Cry, Cry My Name," Cry, you know. Yeah. So I've I've enjoyed this this conversation. Yes, I have, learned, yeah. and uh, would you have any parting words, so to speak, for any other person just embarking on this journey? either reg- uh, regarding the creative process yeah. or whatever you think they'll benefit from knowing. I think it's probably summed up in 
the first single from the album. I will not <laughs> give up my dreams for you. I think it's it's, it's never too late to be uh, fulfill your creative dreams and ideas and creativity if it's part of you. Uh, whether you think it's something that's going to change your entire life or whether it's just if you have a creative idea, I would uh, I would say follow that creative dream. For me, it's taken me a while to to get to the stage of bringing the album out and and, and writing the songs and go through the process, but. Uh, it's been very rewarding for me to, to be able to get. So I would say to people, yeah, if you have a, a, a creative idea, creative outlet, uh, don't wait for someone else's permission to do it. Go ahead and fulfil that creative dream y- yourself, whether it's for your own pleasure or other people can get pleasure out of it. But go ahead and, and, and follow that creative process. Okay. And um, I'll, I'll add, um, according to Peter's school of thought yeah. or preference, is yeah. music before the lyrics. Yeah, <laughs> that's, true, yeah. <laughs> that's something I'm taking away from here. Yeah. Listeners, we've come to the end of today's episode. And for you, if you want to uh, listen to Peter's album, the, you can get the details and the links uh, to the show notes. And I'm sure it's scrolling across the screen now. You could get um, Companion, Companion Ladder. Ladder yeah. That's the title of the album. It's a nine track album. You'll be surprised. Pleasantly so, I must say. <laughs> Thank you for joining us and hopefully you join us next time. Thank you very much. Cheers. Thank you.